Well, if you have your Bible, I'm going to invite you <clears throat> to turn with us to Matthew chapter 17. You can find the same story in Mark chapter 9. They're parallels. There's a few differences. We'll point those out. But I kind of was moved <clears throat> upon, uh, I felt like the Lord would have us to preach on this this morning uh, as kind of a theme leading into 2023. I was actually reading in Mark <clears throat> chapter 9 when this uh, was impressed upon me. <clears throat> but I decided to come out of Matthew 17 because it has a little phrase in it that Mark doesn't include. So um, I feel like the Lord has spoken to us or to me in order to speak to all of us about the importance of prayer and fasting and how we need to get back to it. And if you've never kind of been there to, uh, to get to it for the first time, so to speak. <clears throat> and here's why. We're all engaged in a spiritual battle. Now, if you are not aware of that, that means that the enemy is doing a pretty good job because we should be keenly aware of that. The Scriptures have told us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, and spiritual forces in heavenly places. That's not sometimes. That's all the time. That is without ceasing. That's a 24-7 onslaught. Comes in various shapes and sizes. The entirety of the church is in a spiritual warfare. All you have to do is look at <clears throat> churches shutting down, churches splitting, pastors running off with deacons' wives, deacons running off with pastors' wives, uh, sexual abuse in our youth groups, uh, sexual abuse, I mean physical abuse in our children's ministries, so forth and so on. It's happening inside of the church. So I want you to just, we're just going to start uh, by looking at the text, and then we're going to move to <clears throat> some other. Now, I've got a lot of verses. So I want you to just stay at, at Matthew 17 and allow us to put them up on the screen, the adjunct verses, so that you can follow along so you're not distracted with trying to turn them in your Bible. You might want to pin them down so that you can reference them later. Let's look at Matthew chapter 17. <clears throat> Excuse me, verses 14 through 21. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, <clears throat> and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and, I, and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Let's pray. Lord, we just come before you and your word. We humble ourselves under the authority of your word. God, I pray this morning that you would help us to hear with a believing heart the words that you speak. Help us to understand, God, that you said what you meant and you meant what you said. And God, that it's true even if we can't reconcile it and understand it in our own mind. And that we would be a wise people, a wise people to take it to heart and to apply it in our lives. Help us to do that. Help me to preach it. God, I can't do it without your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let's immediately look at another scripture. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to look at verse 12 and verses 18 and 19. <clears throat> for we do not wrestle, this is kind of a reiteration of what I just said, for we do not wrestle, that doesn't say we have not wrestled or we shall not wrestle, it says we do not, current tense, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, 
against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That is an ongoing battle that you and I are engaged in right now. And if we're unaware of that, it's because the enemy has hidden himself well. But we've been warned that we have an adversary who roams to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. That's a 24-7, 365. We are engaged in a spiritual battle, whether or not you want to all the time, want to or not. Now let's look at verses 18 and 19. <clears throat> Key word, after you put on all the armor of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. In other words, not just praying for yourself, but praying for others. And then Paul, who's writing the letter to the church at Ephesus, says, And for me, pray for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. In other words, Paul was wrestling and fighting against a fear. A fear of man, something that would cause him to back down and to be quiet so that he would not be at the forefront, so that he would not be the uh, people's target, number one. But he knows that he was called to preach the gospel. And, And here's Paul writing a letter, and in the letter he's saying, when you pray, pray for me that I might speak how I should speak. Now, let me let me just say this. If Paul says... I need prayer to preach the gospel boldly, courageously, and accurately, then brothers and sisters, you and I need prayer. And he said, I want you to pray for me. So I want you to pray for me. And you need me to pray for you. And we need to pray for each other. Why? Because we are in a battle. And among other things, the battle is to take away your faith and to quieten your voice so that the gospel does not go forth. And the church is doing, and the enemy is doing a pretty good job of that. Now, Jesus and his inner circle, Peter, James, and John, they've been up on a mountain, the mountain of transfiguration. He's up there, and he's being prophesied about his death. He laid down his, his, uh, he, 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 he let his glory slip out. Peter, James, and John saw it. They heard a voice from heaven. They're having a mountaintop experience. But when that mountaintop experience is over, they go to the bottom of the mountain. They go to the bottom of the mountain, and the other nine disciples are down there. They don't have Peter, James, and John. They don't have the rock. They don't have the rock. They don't have the rock. All right? They don't have the rock, and they don't have the sons of thunder. Sounds like a wrestling team, doesn't it? And they don't have Jesus. And they're down at the bottom of the mountain, and there is chaos, as as Sean and I referred to. There is a circus going on at the bottom of the mountain. And they go down, and and here's what Jesus runs upon. He runs upon uh, nine disciples at the foot of the mountain in an ongoing conflict with a desperate father, a demon-possessed teen, a disputing bunch of scribes, and a doubting crowd. And all of it is because a man has brought his teenage son. The reason I say he's a teenager is because his father's bringing him, and it says that this has been a plague of his from childhood. So he's not a child, he's not an adult, so he's a tweener, and that's, that, that's the teens. And the, 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 the man has brought his son to the disciples that they might cure him, that they might deliver him, they might, that they might help him, and they can't do it. They can't do it. And so the scribes are, are yang, 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 yang on the disciples. And the, and the man is yang, yang, yang on the disciples. And here's the little demon-possessed boy. And all the crowd is standing around going, wonder if he's going to do it this time. You think he can do it? Who is this guy? We've heard about him. You think he's going to do something this time? That boy's, been, that boy's in bad shape. And, and it's just a chaotic mess that Jesus comes down. And so when Jesus comes down, he hears the scribes uh, fussing with his disciples. And he asks the question, Mark's uh, gospel record makes this a little bit more plain. He says, why are you contending with my disciples? Well, before the disciples can answer, the father, it it says in Mark's uh, gospel, that the father comes up and falls prostrate 
before Jesus. And he says, my son has a demon, and I brought him to your uh, disciples to uh, cast him out, and they could not. And that's where he makes this famous statement that everybody uh, kind of c- condemns him for. And he says, but if you can, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus repeats his uh, question saying, if I can, it's not like if I can, it's if you can believe, all things are possible to him believe. And here's what the man said, and this is kind of in Mark's gospel, and this is kind of the crux of where we come from in Matthew's gospel account of it. Here's what he said. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. He knew that he believed that Jesus could do it. He just wasn't sure that Jesus would do it. He knew that Jesus could do it. He just wasn't sure if Jesus would do it. And Jesus said, all things are possible to them that believe. Now, there's three statements that Jesus makes I'm gonna, in three verses. I'm going to read them to you. Let's go back to the text, Matthew 17, 17. Here's what he says in 17, 17. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Second statement, because of your unbelief, that's, this is why answering the question in private conversation with the disciples, why could we not cast it out? Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, statement number three, this kind does not come out without prayer and fasting. Now here's the question. Jesus has already answered it. And he said, the reason you nine disciples could not cast this demon out of this boy is because you have no faith. Now, if you look it up, the word unbelief, or sometimes the phrase little faith, it will say little faith or undeveloped faith. That is not what he's talking about. That's a poor interpretation. It means zero faith. You have zero faith. And that's alluded to by the fact that when he goes down and says in verse 20 that if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed, and it will be moved. So what he's saying is, is if you have that much faith, you can do what you're wanting to do. But you don't have that much faith. And that is a slap in the face to his disciples because here's the question. Could they do it? Yes. Then why didn't they do it? Jesus answers the question. Because of your unbelief. But we already find in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 and 8, if we put those up for me, Carla, And when he had called his 12, this is earlier, this is earlier, and when he had called his 12 disciples, okay, that's not just the inner circle, that's all of them, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases. Look at verse 8. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. Oh, watch this now. Cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely you give. They come back shortly after this, and they rejoice at the fact that the demons are subject to them, meaning they have to respond appropriately to the command that the demons are subject to them in the name of Jesus. So they have not only been authorized to cast out demons, that is, given the authority to do it, they have actually done it. Now, they can't. Now, they are all still disciples. They are all still saved. So what has changed? Do they still have the authority given to them by Jesus? Yes. What has changed? They have no faith. Why not? Because they had not been praying. They had not been praying. Now, this is not in the text, but it's implied. Do you think 
that those other nine disciples, if they had been asked by Jesus, boys, do y'all believe in me? Yes. Boys, do y'all remember when I authorized you to cast out demons? I do. Boys, have y'all done that? We all have. Boys, y'all have no faith. And you're going, what? How do you make sense of that? And here's what the deal was. They thought they had faith because they believed in Jesus. But they did not have faith in the place where they were trying to minister. And they thought, and this is going to hit everybody in the church, and it's going to hit all the churches, they thought because they believed in Jesus and because they were sons of God that they could just walk around with their get-out-of-hell-free card and minister in the power of the Holy Spirit without prayer. So when we say, why is the church so weak today? We have revivals. We have singings. We have Bozo the Clown, the Doughboy Quartet. We have the gym. We have five ba bands, a bus, and a partridge in a pear tree. What's our problem? We are not We're not praying. We have faith in faith. We believe because we did once, we automatically can again. We believe that if it happened over here, that it has to happen over here. And what we miss is the fact that all of Christianity is a relationship with God. Now, this book is when God talks to us. When do you talk to God? When have you had a conversation with the Master? To the point that you feel the empowerment of the Holy Spirit come upon you. The old Pentecostals called it praying through. When you get up and you don't know exactly what you're going to do, but you know you're going to do something and God's going to be in the middle of it. When you know that God is going to do something and he's going to put you in on it. He's going to let you in on it. Notice how Jesus links these together. Listen now. He said their unbelief is the lack of prayer and fasting. Now the question is, is do you think the disciples thought that they lacked faith? No. So when I stand in front of the congregation of the church and I say, we lack faith, you go, no, we don't. When I look at myself, which is why I was confronted with this, and I say, man, I'm sitting here reading my word, and the word says, Randy, you don't have any power in your life because your power is equivalent to your prayer. And if you're praying for 15 minutes, you got 15 minutes worth of power. You're putting a gallon worth of gas and you're trying to drive to Montana. And I'm sitting there praying, Lord, I pray every day. He said, look at it again. So I went back at it and I looked at it again. He said, because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will move, to, you will say to this mountain. Now notice he is equating the mountain which is an immovable, humanly impossible situation. He's equating the mountain, the mountain he just came off of, he's equating the mountain to the situation that they are encountering with the demon-possessed boy. And he says, the demon-possessed boy is a place where you could not move and minister without me. See, we want to get our get saved card and then go live for Jesus. You can't do that. You, you do not have the means to live for Jesus without Jesus himself. To live for God, you need God. 
To understand God's Word, you need God. To walk with God, you need God. To walk with you, to lead you, to guide you. It's an ongoing, abiding relationship. It's not where we get our get-out-of-hell free card and then go live to the best of our ability and whistle for God when we run up on a mountain called a demon-possessed boy or addiction or adultery or pornography or divorce or a child in prison. When we run up into a situation that we cannot move, we cry out, Oh, God! He goes, I've been waiting for that for a long time. Because that oh God prayer is how I want you to approach me all the time. Because you don't understand that without me, you are in an oh God situation. Every single day of your life, without God, you are in an oh God situation. Tell me that you don't want God in your life. Who is keeping the cars on the other side of the road? Who's keeping Putin from lobbing one over here? Who, who's orchestra? Who's, who's keeping the sun coming up? Who's spinning this earth right now? Talking about the earth, uh, talking about climate change. Oh, it's changing, but it ain't, it ain't, it ain't to the end yet, babe. You say, Brother Rain, how much oil do we have in the earth? Enough to get us to the end. You know, God didn't say, Dad, gummit, I didn't put enough oil down there for them boys. God, tell me you don't want God in your wife's life, in your husband's life, in your children's life, in your parents' life. Tell me you don't want God in your business. Tell me you want to run it on your own. Tell me you want to be the shot caller. Got no idea. Because the Bible says that the breath that you have in your lungs was breathed in Adam by God and passed to you. You're breathing borrowed air on lungs that you did not create, thinking with a brain that you did not build, walking in a body that was, that was given to you. You own nothing. Woo! Hallelujah. Preach, Brother Randy. Now look at this. <clears throat> Where there is lack of prayer, there is lack of faith and lack of power, whether you realize it or not. You say, Pastor Randy, I got the power of the Holy Ghost. Really? How you know? How you know? Are all your mountains moving? Everything coming up roses in your life? Are you understanding the scriptures? Are you growing in with your... Well, in other words, what changed in your life with the Lord in 2022 that was different than 2021? What do you expect different in 2023? If the world is growing darker, don't you think we need a little bit more power? Don't you think we need a little bit more wisdom? Don't you think we need to, uh, a, a little more help? If we could just put, break it down this way. Don't you think... How many of y'all could just use a little bit more help? I don't care what it is, just a little bit more help. Amen. Well, where do you reckon that's going to come from? The Democrats? The Republicans? Huh? Canada? Where do y'all think? Where, where, if you could use some help, where are you going to get it? Jesus. And how do you get it? By prayer and the Word of God. Mark 11, 22 through 24, if we put that one up there. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Why is it important to have faith in God? Notice now that your faith is in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, what is the mountain? Any immovable, humanly impossible situation. Whoever will say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Now right there is where the disciples tripped. The disciples thought that their things that they said would be done. And they had their faith in their faith. But the first sentence corrects it. Have faith in God. Because it's not you that moves the mountain. You can speak to the mountain and it moves. 
But I assure you, it was not any power that you had. It was the power of God in you and through you. And that power was being maintained and nurtured in prayer. Prayer is the key to the tractor. Prayer is the key to the tractor. Now, that tractor is big, and it does big things, but without the key. And we think that the key is a little bitty thing. But the key unlocks the power. It creates the spark. It sets the gears in motion. Without the key, your tractor, you got your big old pretty tractor. All you got is something to cut grass around if you ain't got a key. And that's what the church has become, is a big old pretty thing to look at. But we ain't got no key. And we're trying to drag it instead of letting God crank it. And yet, when I say we need to pray more, everybody says, amen. Nobody prays more. We need to fast. Amen. And nobody fasting. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Verse 19, I mean Luke 11, verse 9 and 10 and 13. Let's listen to how all these flow together. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. What is happening right there? How do you ask, seek, and knock? Prayer. Prayer. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. But if you walk around with your I'm saved card in your pocket, and you're not praying, and you're not asking, well, you're not going to receive. And if you're not seeking, you ain't going to find. And if you're not knocking, it ain't going to be open to you. It don't matter how saved you are. I mean, did Jesus not say this? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? When was the last time you prayed in earnestness for God to anoint you with a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit? So that on any moment of any day, you would have the power, as Paul said, to speak the gospel boldly. That you would have the boldness to lay hands on your own family and pray for their healing. That you would walk up to an addict or an alcoholic or some homeless man on the street and say with conviction and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God is your help. God is your hope. And if you will trust him, he will cause you to get up off the ground and put your mat under your arm and walk out of this place. Instead of walking by going, man, that's so sad. Man, listen. Here's what what the apostles did. They're just going to church. Peter and John's just going to church in the book of Acts. They just walk. It's time for prayer. It was prayer meeting. They just going to prayer meeting. They see a homeless guy over here, a helpless guy. He's crippled from birth, laying on a mat, and he's begging, shaking a cup. He's wanting some money. Here's what they say. They ain't got no money. But what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. And that man got up and put his mat under his arm and went to skip to Malou, my darling, up in church. Nobody had to beg him to come to church. Nobody had to send him an invitation. When God moved in his life, the first thing he wanted to do was hold on to Jesus and get in the house of God. Which, by the way, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of house of prayer it was about the ninth hour they were going up to the temple to 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 have fellowship meal no Uh, they they were going up to the temple to do yoga no Uh, they were going up to the temple for their knitting group no they were going up to the temple uh to do zoom 
Zumba, that's it, Zumba. Now, they were going up there to, uh, well, what were they going up there for? They, they were going up there to pray. Tell me who in the temple recognized Jesus as Jesus when he was born. We just got through with the story. It was Simeon, and it was Anna. And the Bible says that Anna served God daily with fastings and prayer. And Simeon had been seeking God, and God had been speaking to Simeon. So he said, Lord, now your servant is, is de going to depart in peace because you have allowed me to see the salvation of your people. It's the seekers. It's the ones who are praying and looking for that find and see and experience. You say, Pastor Randy, I hadn't found anything. I hadn't, I hadn't experienced a powerful move of God in a long while. Let me just, let me just uh, paraphrase my man from the Salvation Army. What's his name, Larry? Yeah, William Booth. Here's what William Booth said. I believe it. I believe this is true as, as, mu as much as I'm standing on this carpet on this stage right here. He said, I am not waiting for a move of God. I am a move of God. I'm not waiting for God to stir the waters. I'm going to stir the waters. And the God in me is going to do it. Do you believe that you could be a move of God in 2023 in your business, in your family, in your church, in the world. Do you believe that? Here's what Jesus said. All things are possible to them that believe. I don't believe it, Pastor Randy. That's because you ain't praying. You ain't prayed through the truth of this scripture until it becomes a revelation in your spirit. It's just something being taught. But when it drops down in your heart and you go, my God, I'm waiting on God to do something, and God's waiting on me. He gave me the key. I'm waiting on God to crank the tractor, and he gave me the key. I'm waiting on God to crank the tractor, and he gave me the key. Do you know that you have the key? The disciples had the key. They couldn't cast out the demon. Jesus says, because you're unbelief. Well, we do believe. No, you don't, you, you don't believe. You, you believe that I can. You don't believe that I will. Put the key in, boy, and pray. He says, pray and fasting. What is fasting? Y'all brace yourself now. <clears throat> fasting is the voluntary, not preacher prescribed, not good idea, not denominationally driven, it's the voluntary abstinence of food and or drink, sometimes accompanied by the forsaking of other fleshly pleasures. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 7 says, For a husband and wife to dedicate themselves to prayer and fasting, they should abstain from sexual relationships. Now, bro, you don't got serious about your praying when you're getting in Ricky, Ricky and Lucy bed. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all yeah, know them Ricky and Lucy. I always wonder how you could have little Ricky. <laughs> but he says in the scripture that you would fast sexual intimacy with your wife with agreement so as to dedicate yourself to prayer and fasting. Bro, that's done got serious up in here. And you say, Pastor Randy, that's pretty serious. I go, yeah. When was the last time you were serious enough that you would go that far? That you would go that far to pray? You, you can fast in this world without prayer, but you can't spiritually fast without prayer. They are inseparable. And according to Jesus, I'm going to read it again. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So according to Jesus, there is a level of breakthrough spiritually that cannot be reached or attained without prayer and fasting. There's something, you, you might be wanting and desiring God to do something, and God has given you the key, and it will not happen 
in the sovereignty of God, it will not happen unless you and I pray and fast. He said, this kind, there is a kind of mountain. There is a kind of devil. There is a kind of spirit. There is an addiction. There is, there is a mountain that you will not go around, go over, or go through without prayer and fasting. I didn't say it. Jesus did. This kind. I'm going to say it real good. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So, Pastor Rainer, what role is fasting? Glad you asked. First of all, let's see what it is. It's the deprivation, self-deprivation of food and or water in order to seek the Lord. In order to seek the Lord. In order to seek the Lord. It is an act of humility. A demonstration of desperateness. Implied by the word supplication. And dependence. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, say it. Without me, you can do nothing. Abide in me. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it will be done. You will ask. That's prayer. You will ask. That's petition. You will ask. That's asking, seeking, and knocking. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it will be done for you. For without me, you say, Pastor Randy, I'm saved. Yeah, I am too. The disciples were too. But they couldn't cast out that devil. Why? Because without me, you can do nothing. And Jesus was teaching them a lesson. Baby, this is not about getting your name on the roll. This is not about being baptized and getting you a certificate. This is not about getting you a get-out-of-hell-free card. This is about walking with me on a daily basis. If any man desire to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross. Hallelujah. Put it over his shoulder and follow me. You can't make a decision for the Lord and him walk off and you stay over here thinking that just because you have been appointed that you are anointed. And it's an abiding relationship. It is the deprivation of our flesh in order to demonstrate to the Lord that we are devoted, 100% attentive to our prayer. How do you prove to yourself that you are serious? How do you prove to the Lord? You say, Pastor Randy, I don't need to prove anything to the Lord. The Lord knows my heart. True. But there is something you need to prove to the Lord. When God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, he said, put him up on that mountain and kill him. So he took the fire, and he took the wood, and he took his son. He bound him up with the rope. He laid him on the altar. He had the wood fixed, and he raised his knife to kill him. God said, stay your hand, Abraham, for now I know. You trust me. Now I know you trust me. But God, you say, Pastor Randy, uh, I believe God loves me. Yes, he did, but he didn't say take my word for it. The Bible says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God never said one time, just take my word for it. He demonstrated. So when we are serious about our prayers and seeking after God, there should be a demonstration of our seriousness before God. It ought to be a little bit more important than now I lay me down to sleep. So let's look at it. In, Psalm, uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we're just going to go through this list quickly. Uh, fasting and prayer was used and was designed to humble ourselves. How many of y'all have ever humbled yourself in the sight of the Lord, James said? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Y'all know what that means? Bring yourself low. How do you do that? 
Well, let's, let's look at it. Psalm 35, 13. But as for me, this is, the psalmist was talking about he was interceding for his friends. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting. And my prayer, notice how they go together, would return to my own heart, meaning that they, they were my enemies and I was praying and fasting for them and they cared nothing about it. Humbling ourselves. Let's look at uh, fasting and praying for favor. That is, breakthroughs, opportunity. How many of y'all ever wanted a job? Pray God for a job. Amen. Pray God for, pray God for an opportunity to get hired. You ever fasted to do that? Well, look, let's look at this. Esther 4, 16 and 17. Asking for faith and protection. Here's what she said. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. They weren't fasting for themselves. They were fasting for someone else. How many of y'all ever said, pray for me, I need? How many of y'all have a friend that you would feel comfortable saying, I need you to pray and fast for me? How many of y'all have a friend that would fast for you for 24 hours? How many of y'all are a friend to someone that if they called you and said, would you fast for me for 24 hours, I have a need that you would do that? Here's what Esther said. Gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. Talking about a friend. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king. Now, why is she asking for prayer? Because if you walked into the presence of the king without being invited, it was a death sentence. They kill you. It was called dissing in today's vernacular. Disrespect. You diss the king when you walk up without invitation. They'll kill you. So she said, I will go to the king which is against the law. And if I perish... I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. She fasted, her maids fasted, and all the Jews fasted and prayed for her to have favor with the king and protection. How many of y'all want your families to be protected? How many of you have ever fasted for it? Amen. Good for you. How about direction and protection? Look at Ezra, chapter 8, verse 21 through 23. Then I proclaimed a fast there. At the river Ahava, here's the word, that we might humble ourselves before our God. To what? To seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road. Because we had all spoken to the king, saying, the hand of our God is upon us all for those is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake them. In other words, Ezra went and popped off of his mouth about how much God favored the faithful and how much God uh, hated the wicked. And then he said, so we fasted and entreated our God for this. What? For, faith, for protection, for the escort of souls, for this. And he, and he answered our prayer. Let's look at Jehoshaphat, who in a time of war sought, the, sought God's guidance and protection, 2 Chronicles. Look at this. Then, came, then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. In other words, there's, a, there's, a, there's an army coming that you can't beat. There's a mountain that's walking up into your backyard, Jehoshaphat, and it's going to crush you. And Jehoshaphat feared. Feared what? Feared for his life, feared for his people, feared for his crown, feared for his land. And he set himself to seek the Lord. What is fasting? It's the deprivation of food and water for a period of time to seek the Lord. And proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. How many of you need help? Help from the Lord. And from all the city of Judah, they came to what? Seek the Lord. How about if we just change prayer meeting to God seeking? See, you say, I don't need to pray. I don't need to go to prayer meeting. I pray all the time. But, and you kind of write that one off, but I say, how about we say from 6.30 to 7.30, we're going to seek God's help. I don't believe anybody in here say, well, I don't need God's help. Not today. Isn't it funny how we can write off prayer because we pray? 
But we wouldn't dare write off help. But praying is seeking God's help. Just a thought. All right, let's go on. Spiritual warfare, Matthew chapter 4. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Matthew 4, 1 and 2, Shannon. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Can anybody say amen? In, a, in another gospel, it said he fasted. He neither ate nor drank. I told, a, I told that to a, uh, an anesthesiologist. He was about 70 years old, 80 at the time. And this was back in the 90s. We were in, in surgery, and we were talking about surgery and fasting and all of this, and we were kind of on this topic. And I said, well, you know, Jesus fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. Neither He neither ate nor drank. He goes, that's impossible. I said, I know. I know. When you, when you jump off in a 40-day and 40-night fast, you better be led by the Lord. I said, God kept him alive. The Scripture said that the angels came and ministered to him. But let me tell you something. He was going face-to-face -face and toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil in the enemy's territory on our behalf. And the Savior of our souls fasted for 40 days, 40 nights, and gave himself to prayer. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, Can you not tarry with me one hour? Pray that you enter not into temptation. What he's saying was that you don't get tricked by the devil and fall prey to his devices. Pray that you enter not into temptation. The Bible says three times he kept them back, came back and they were sleeping. He said, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. How do we strengthen our flesh? How do we become resilient in our flesh? By depriving it of something for a little while. By saying no to the things that just make us want to, you know, cut a shut and act a fool. How about just saying no to your flesh and get up a little early so you can pray? How about just saying no to your flesh and no to your Pop-Tarts and no to your biscuits and no to your grits and no to your ice mocha coffee frappy lappies? How about, how about just saying, you know what, today... All the way to supper time, it's just me and God and water. And every time I get hungry, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to believe God for miracles. I'm going to believe God to not only move my mountains, I'm going to believe God to move your mountain. I'm praying for you. I'm fasting and I'm praying for you. I'm, I'm depriving myself of bodily pleasure so that I can pray for you. Pray for the church. Pray for our nation. Uh, I'm not going to go the rest of them, but you, in, in, in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius was praying and fasting and seeking the Lord, and at the same time, God spoke to Peter and said, go see Cornelius because he's a Gentile, and we're going to bring him into the fold. Uh, the Bible says in Acts 13 that the church at Antioch was ministering to the Lord with prayer and fastings. In Acts chapter 14, it says, before the church appointed elders, they always prayed and fasted. So let's just jump ahead really quickly. I'm, I'm going to hurry. Let's look at some of the physical benefits. Y'all think God knows what he's doing? You know, the Bible says in James that bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and the life that is to come. You say, well, what is godliness? Well, part of that is fasting and prayer. God said fasting and prayer will do as much for your body as that treadmill will and more. Because bodily exercise is going to profit you a little. But godliness is profitable to all things. Let's look at this. Uh, you can look this up. I know some of y'all will want to. Intelligentliving.com or .co. Fasting and prayer has been practiced for eons and plays a role in almost every major religion in the world. Here are facts. It benefits the physical body, the brain, and the emotions. Not to mention your spiritual health. It minimizes oxidation, which causes inflammation in the body. You have rheumatoid arthritis and sore joints. 
fasting improves that by reducing the inflammation markers in your body. It reboots your metabolism to keep it at optimum levels. In other words, the older you get, the slower your metabolism gets. You want to speed it up fast. To see if you can find one of that. When they charge you to be your health coach and your fitness guru, and they don't include fasting, you need to tell them, say, you charge me $100 for information, but I'm going to charge you 99 to tell you about the benefits of fasting. That way I, I only have to pay you a dollar for your services. It boosts heart health. It detoxes the liver. It cleans and reboots the digestive tract. Y'all know everybody's taking probiotics? You know what God's probiotic is? Stop eating for 24 hours and cleanse your system with water and your entire gut flora will reboot. Reduces body fat. Slows the aging process. Heals neurodegenerative disorders. Heals mood disorders. Releases the SIRT1 gene which promotes longevity. <clears throat> and fights inflammation. It protects against diabetes, hypertension, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, cancers, malignancies, obesity, and alters brain neurochemistry, improving brain function, offsetting dementia. Reckon God knew what he was doing? You folks, you, baby, did you get that? Write that down. And here's the sad part. Everybody in here will take off fasting so they don't get demented. But never worry about the mountain that's in their life. Never worry about somebody else. Never worry that souls will die and go to hell. That churches will die. Just don't want to go crazy. Hey, a little crazy is good. Especially the older you get. See, I can't fight like I used to. I can't last as long. But see, I'm a little more crazy. <laughs> Meaning that I ain't going to fight according to Hoyle's rules. Amen? Amen. I'll cheat a pipe you. <laughs> I'll 38 you. Whoop your tail, old man. It'll be after you get them five pieces of lead out of your tail. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> Amen? A little crazy is good. A little crazy is good. I'm making light of that. Because what I'm saying is, is that people will take off fasting because Pastor Reddy said it does this and it does this and it does this and not one soul will mention that it will strengthen your flesh so that you would not enter into temptation. That it will, it will, it will help you lay hands on your child when a devil's got him twisted sideways and cast it out. It'll give you insight to what's going on when they have a pandemic. It'll give you clarity of thought. Purify your body. Yes. Strengthen your soul is more important. And Jesus expected us to fast. Do you know that? Mark 2.20. But the days will come when the bridegroom, that's Jesus, will be taken away from them. And then they will fast in those days. It didn't say they can. It didn't say it's a good idea. It didn't say I suggest it. It said they will. He was leaving, and we need to stay vitally connected to him. Living vitally, and when I'm talking about vital, vitally, I'm talking about with that overflowing life of Jesus that he died to give us. Living vitally and victoriously as sons and daughters of God is not achieved by simply receiving our authority and putting it in our wallet. It requires that we stay connected, earnestly seeking God in prayer with fasting. In 2023... I think it's time for me, I think it's time for us, I think it's time for New Beginnings to go back to prayer and fasting. I believe that God would have us to fast one day a week. I myself am setting aside Wednesday for breakthrough. A time that we would ask and seek and knock. Every night we will end our prayer with communion. Because we are in a war and we have an adversary who is seeking whom he may, he may devour. And we need protection. Because we've never been this way before. 
We need guidance. Because we live in a fallen world that seeks to shape our mind and values, and we need wisdom. Because we're facing giants that are trying to kill us in mountains that won't move, and we need courage. Because our faith wavers, and we need perseverance. And because Jesus said, this kind does not go out except by prayer.